Well, hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is the fourth and possibly final episode of Vaccines, Friend or Foe, How is a Parent to Decide? The purpose of this series was to try and sift through some of the misinformation on the internet and give parents good information on which they can base decisions for their families. I'm your host, Dr. Bob. I'm an internal medicine physician in Northern Michigan and a father of vaccinated children. I also have my vaccinations up to date. For most of my career, my practice was in general internal medicine. We did flu shots, but we weren't heavily involved in vaccinations of children. In the first three episodes, we discussed vaccine-preventable diseases and the vaccination recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control. In this episode, I'd like to discuss some of the more popular internet myths and vaccine hesitancy. No discussion of the anti-vax movement can be complete without a discussion of this gentleman, Mr. Andrew Wakefield, who was a former physician from England that published a paper in 1998 linking the MMR vaccine to autism. In that paper, which is linked in the description, he had 12 investigators look at 12 children with gastrointestinal issues. As a result of his study, he felt he found a causal relation between the MMR vaccine and autism. While this paper was originally accepted for publication in Lancet, the British Medical Journal, subsequent review failed to demonstrate his findings. In fact, 10 of the original 12 investigators backed out of the study. After further peer review, the study was in fact retracted from Lancet and Dr. Wakefield uh, eventually lost his license to practice medicine. He continues to actively promote a link between the MMR vaccine and autism, although there is absolutely no scientific evidence suggesting a causal relationship. While you're welcome to read the papers and review the peer review, I'd like you to keep in mind two things. Autism is normally diagnosed around age five or six. We are also much more aware of autism now, and doctors are trained specifically to look for it. As the father of a child with autism spectrum, albeit mild, I did look into this around the time of this study. After much consideration, it's my professional opinion that the link between autism and the MMR vaccine does not exist. The reason that we have an increase in diagnosis of autism is that doctors are specifically trained to look for it and we're better at it. And the fact that it happens to occur around the time children are vaccinated is merely coincidence rather than a causation relationship. Perhaps even worse than Andrew Wakefield is Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. She is a former nephrologist or kidney specialist that went into homeopathy. Dr. Humphreys wrote a book in the early 90s suggesting that vaccination was actually dangerous. Her ideas, although questionable, enjoy widespread traction in the anti-vax movement on the internet and YouTube. The first assertion that she makes is that morbidity and mortality from measles is negligible. Prior to the advent of the vaccination in 1968, 500 children a year died in the United States of measles and almost 50,000 were hospitalized due to complications. She also characterizes it as a mild disease, more of an inconvenience than a danger. She neglects to mention that one in a thousand patients with wild measles gets encephalitis. Other complications include pulmonary and kidney damage. As noted, even in non-fatal cases, nearly 50,000 people needed to be hospitalized a year before the advent of the measles vaccination. As the measles vaccination is an attenuated live virus, she asserts that people get measles from the vaccination. This is not true. They may develop a rash and a fever a week or two after the vaccination, but this is the body's cellular immunity getting to work. It is not the actual disease measles like a wild virus would cause. She went on to document 48 cases of encephalitis out of 75 million uh, amongst people that got the attenuated vaccine. Although she doesn't document an actual causal relationship between the vaccination and these cases of encephalitis, recall that the actual wild virus has an incident rate of 1 in 1,000 for encephalitis. The point being made is that even if all 48 cases out of 75 million were caused by the vaccination, this is equivalent to the number of cases of encephalitis that would have occurred 
in the 48,000 people hospitalized a year prior to the vaccination. She also suggests that like the flu vaccine, vaccination against measles does not protect people against all strains. While it is true that there are 19 specific genotypes of measles virus, there is only one serotype, and the vaccination works against that serotype, providing lifelong immunity. The measles vaccination also promotes both antibody and cellular immunity. Dr. Humphreys even goes as far as to suggest that antibodies themselves are harmful, citing something called antibody-dependent enhancement. While this does occur in some rare diseases like dengue fever and HIV, it's not been shown to occur in any of the vaccine-preventable diseases. Immediately after discussing the harm that vaccine-induced antibodies can create, she promotes antibodies in breast milk as an alternative. Antibodies are antibodies, be they produced in your body or you get them in breast milk, and the breast milk antibodies do not induce an antibody response in the child. They are essentially protective while the child is nursing. She then goes on to recommend vitamins as a viable alternative to vaccination. Although rates of measles plummeted in 1968 when the vaccine was released, and it was in fact declared eradicated uh, during the 80s, we are now enjoying an outbreak of measles as a result of the efforts of people like Wakefield and Humphreys. In addition to measles, we've had outbreaks of hepatitis A and pertussis here in Michigan, mostly in unvaccinated children. In preparing this presentation, I reviewed an article by Eve Dupay on vaccine hesitancy. There's a link to it in the description. Her opinion, which I share, is that vaccine hesitancy is not an educational issue. People accept or question vaccination based on a number of factors, and in order to increase vaccination rates, we need to address all of those factors, and I'd like to go over a few of them. But this particular slide bears mentioning. Outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases are tied to non-vaccinated or under-vaccinated communities. An example of this was an outbreak of pertussis that we had at a charter school here in Michigan last year. There was a very high percentage of unvaccinated children at that school, and some 20 or 30 of them got pertussis. After the initial case came in, the rest developed pertussis in a mini-epidemic. Vaccine hesitancy is a serious enough problem that the World Health Organization declared it as one of their top 10 priorities for 2019. Before we delve into the reasons for vaccine hesitancy, let's discuss the purpose of vaccines again. Vaccinations stimulate antibodies and in some cases cellular responses to specific vaccine-preventable diseases. By introducing elements of the infectious agent, be they cell walls or even an attenuated live virus, they elicit an immune response in the body. This immune response primes the machinery, so to say, so that if the body ever receives uh, introduction of one of these infectious diseases, it has the tools needed to fight it immediately. The principle behind what they call herd immunity is rather simple. Your chances of getting measles are very low if you're not exposed to measles. Having a high percentage of people immunized against vaccine-preventable diseases reduces the chance that you will be exposed to that disease. While this is a very good thing for all of us, it is especially essential to people that cannot be vaccinated or don't respond to vaccines, such as the immune compromised or the very young. Vaccination is not a personal liberty issue. It is a public health issue, much like hand washing by restaurant workers. Painting parents in broad strokes, we see that we have acceptors. We have people that accept some vaccines but not others. We have people that deliberately delay vaccination until they have to have them, and then we have people that refuse all vaccinations. Dubé looked at some of the decision-making factors from parents that were not vaccinating their children or delaying the vaccination or partially vaccinating their children, and here they are. Let's go over them one at a time. The first is the parent's knowledge base, and this is the classic reason for not vaccinating children with a twist. They found that the parents that had the highest rates of vaccination knew the least about the diseases and the vaccinations. Their attitude was predominated by, let's trust the experts that have the actual training to do this, 
to help us make these decisions. Parents that were vaccine hesitant actually knew more about the diseases and the vaccinations. Unfortunately, when lay people research technical and scientific issues like this, they tend to have a rather superficial understanding and tend to be rather peculiar in the sources that they will accept. In fact, in a controlled study, merely surfing anti-vaccination sites for 5 to 10 minutes increased vaccine hesitancy. After knowledge came past experience. Is there a family history of people having problems with vaccinations? Do people have adverse reactions to being stuck with a needle? What is the level of comfort and trust that parents have with their vaccination or healthcare providers, or even the staff at the clinics? Next is the actual understanding of immunity and health. I had immunology for several months in medical school, and I'm not sure I still understand it fully myself. I mean that people talk about antibodies, but there's actually five different types of antibodies, all of which do different things. It's a rather complicated subject. And then thanks to Dr. Humphreys and Wakefield, people have these myths that are out there on the internet. Good hygiene makes vaccination unnecessary. That's not true. Vaccines weaken natural immunity. That's also not true. There's also a perception that having a vaccine-preventable disease makes your immune system or your body somehow stronger and that too many vaccinations actually weaken your body's defenses against disease. Again, this tends to be confirmational bias. If you read this on a website, you tend to believe it, whether it's true or not, and you don't do the research to back it up. There are some legitimate questions in this field, and quite frankly, part of this presentation is to start a conversation between you and your provider so that maybe you can get some better answers. The analogy is, is that I could probably find a YouTube video that will tell me how to rebuild the transmission on a GMC Sierra truck. But there are people out there that actually do that for a living. And even if I was a do-it-yourself type of guy, I'd probably want their advice before I started. Never underestimate the value of healthcare provider input in this decision. People that are healthcare providers have degrees that people listen to. Dr. Humphrey and Wakefield played on their medical degrees to develop this following. Healthcare providers that recommend vaccination but refuse to get vaccinated themselves send a message to their patients. So do people like Dr. Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. Before releasing the polio vaccination for nationwide testing, he injected his own family. What message did that send to the parents of America? When making decisions about vaccination, parents go through a decision-making process like any other major decision. What is the danger of the disease? What is the danger of the vaccination? Are there dangerous additives? The problem is, is that most people have never seen a vaccine-preventable disease, both patients and doctors. It's difficult to understand something that you have very little knowledge of. The other problem is that most of the people talking about this are in the anti-vax community. And people that do their research primarily from anti-vax websites are generally given either wrong information or severely confirmational bias information. A good example of this is the additives in vaccinations, the adjuncts. These are um, chemicals that were put into vaccinations to enhance the immune response. A good example of this is mercury compounds. Mercury compounds were removed from vaccinations years ago. However, because they were removed, somehow that makes them evil or bad or dangerous and somehow still present in vaccines. In reality, it was more of a manufacturing decision. Much of the vaccine hesitancy movement is related to trust. Trust of the doctors, trust of the public health and pharmaceutical industries, trust of the government. We all have our own part to play in this. I can't really do too much to help you trust the government or Big Pharma. However, by giving you good advice and taking the time to talk with you about it, perhaps I can gain some of your trust for me. And hopefully by gaining that trust, my words will have some weight in your decision. Finally, we have moral, religious, and personal convictions. People are strongly liberty-minded, or they're Jehovah Witnesses, or the Amish or they believe in natural or alternative medicine. These are part of the makeup of people, and although we can address many of the other issues, it's very difficult to change a person's outlook on life. 
Now, an interesting report came out on CNN the other day about a clinic in, in Pittsburgh that put out a pro-vaccination video, just a short little two-minute video encouraging people to bring their kids in to get vaccinated. In a matter of a few days, they had 797 comments against vaccinations. In addition to categorizing the comments, they traced some of those posts back to almost 200 individual pages and looked at the characteristics of the posters. The posters fell into four basic categories, those with trust issues, those that promoted alternative medicine, those that had questions about the safety of vaccines, and people that promoted conspiracies. 89% were women. They represented 36 states and some eight foreign countries. Now, one thing that I have seen on the internet is a conspiracy theory involving these vaccinations. And that is specifically that they changed the diagnostic criteria for measles and polio in an effort to prove, quote unquote, that the vaccines worked. This would involve millions of healthcare workers, including myself, being involved in a conspiracy to deliberately harm our patients. It's almost offensive. After researching this subject for a couple of months now, I think it all boils down to one factor, and that is trust. I say this because of the high overlap between conspiracy theories and the anti-vax movement. People that are attracted to conspiracy theories have a basic distrust of authority and have very strong personal beliefs that are not shaken by any evidence to the contrary. The key to dealing with this problem is not trying to educate them per se. They don't want to hear it. While educating them about the natural pathogenesis of vaccine preventable diseases is important, the only way to combat vaccine hesitancy is to try and regain the trust of the people that we treat. I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching this series. I hope it gave you some information that will help you make decisions for yourself and your families. I will be monitoring the comments for a while, and if you have any other questions you'd like me to address, perhaps we'll have one more episode. In the meantime, this is Dr. Bob signing out. Please take a moment to like and subscribe to my channel.